Hello everyone, this is Dale from the Precept Classes in Cullman, Alabama. Uh, thank you for joining with us. We're going through the book of Judges right now. This is lesson five. If you haven't looked at the previous lessons, you might do well to do that. It doesn't take long to watch them. I keep them under 10 minutes where I can throw them up on YouTube, okay? But uh, just a quick review. We've looked at all the judges at this point in time. Othniel delivered Israel from Mesopotamia. Ahu delivered them from the uh, from Moab. Shamgar delivered uh, them from the Philistines. Deborah delivered Israel from the Canaanites. And uh, Gideon, whose other name was Jeroboam, delivered Israel from the Midianites. Now, the Gideon story continues because Gideon had another son. He had 70 sons, which tells you that he was into polygamy. Okay? He had several wives. But he had another son named Abimelech. And Abimelech was the son of Gideon by a concubine. Okay, by a concubine. And in Judges 9, we encounter him. Let me tell you right up front what's going on here. Abimelech is not a judge, in my mind. The judges were the ones that God raised up to deliver people. Gideon did something totally different. He usurped and took the kingship of Israel. He was not a judge and a leader. He appointed himself as king. So what he did was, he went to his mother's relatives, the concubine's relatives, and said, hey, Gideon's dead now. Had you rather be ruled over by me, I'm of your line, or by these 70 other people over here? And they said, well, I guess we'd rather be ruled by Cousin Abimelech. And so Cousin Abimelech said, that's great. And so Abimelech went and took the 70 sons of Gideon and killed them all on one stone. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, but I think it means this right here, that these folks put up very little resistance. That They came in, they were captured, and they lined them up one at a time, laid their head down on a stone or whatever it was, and they took their lives. Of those 70, one escaped. Okay, The one that escaped was named Jotham. And Jotham, when he heard what happened to his brother, went to this, I believe the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, because I know God used it, but Jotham went to the top of Mount Gerizim, which we've seen before in Deuteronomy. Gerizim is the Mount of Blessings, okay? Remember when they, uh, God told Israel to, part of you stand on one mountain, part of you stand on another mountain. One side spoke blessings, the other side spoke curses. So this is the Mount of Blessing. And Jotham presented a parable. Uh, make sure you read this parable. And the parable basically said this, that the trees, representative of Israel or whatever, said that, uh, particularly the men of Shechem, said, we want somebody to rule over us. So they went to the olive tree, okay, they went to the fig tree, and they went to a uh, uh, vine, and all of them said, no, 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 I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. That's the moral of the parable, that they were doing what they were supposed to do. Finally, the trees went to the bramble, which is a picture of Abimelech, and the bramble said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put you under my shade, but the bramble is just good for burning, basically. So Jotham declared this and said, if this is what was supposed to happen, if Abimelech is supposed to be your king, then let him be your king. But if it isn't, then God's um, judgment is going to fall upon you, which is exactly what happens at the end of the story. The next thing you see is the Lord sends an evil spirit. And it's really a spirit of ill will. Sometimes people get bent out and say, well, God doesn't send evil spirits. God controls everything. If he wants to use a demonic evil spirit, he can. I have... Uh, less of a problem with the Lord controlling a, a demonic evil spirit than the Lord sending a good angel to do something evil. Okay, see what I mean? And so uh, anyway, he does this. It's the spirit of ill wills, what the idea is, between the men of Shechem and Abimelech. And so all of a sudden you see this other guy that sort of pops up here and he's going, uh, uh, his name was Gaal. And Gaal said, hey, who is this guy Abimelech? Who, you know, who, who made him God? Who put him in charge? Well, uh, Abimelech's right-hand soldier man heard about that. So they sort of set it up, and they wind up attacking Gaal, and they wind up killing him. They wind up salting and destroying the city, doing all these horrible things. Then they go to another city named Thebes, and at that point in time, they're about to capture a tower. In the previous city, the leaders had run into a tower, a thousand men and women, and Abimelech had burned them out, killed them all by fire. Now he's going to the town, he's going to do the same thing again. But this time, when he gets close to the tower, a woman throws a millstone out of the top of the tower and it comes down and lands on his head. It doesn't kill him instantly. It crushes his skull, but he's still uh, conscious, so he looks to his, uh, his servant and he says, kill me because I don't want a woman to kill me. And that's exactly what happened. So then the scripture tells us in uh, Judges 10 that after Abimelech died, that there was a man of Issachar named Tola, and he arose to save Israel, and he judged 23 years. Now, we in this week's homework, we're covering a lot of chapters, 9 through 12. Uh, you see several of what's referred to as minor judges. That doesn't mean that they were inferior. If anything, they actually judged and ruled longer than the ones that have lengthier passages. 
Uh, they're minor simply because we don't know as much about them, and the storylines are shorter. Uh, length of story doesn't have anything to do with importance. It has to do with that God wants certain things for us to see. And so all he tells us about Tola is that he ruled 23 years. And then when he died, another judge, uh, Jair, arose, and he, rose, um, he uh, ruled 22 years. But then when he died, the people of the Lord started again doing evil on the side of the Lord, and they went after the bells. And this really, really angered the Lord. And this is an interesting passage right here in this chapter. Because God, they come back and say, oh, we, we're, we're sorry, Lord, we're sorry for what we did. You know, chapters 10 through, verses 10 through 16 are curious. Uh, God says, you know what? Here's what I did. I delivered you all this kind of stuff. I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, they just called upon the Lord. They said, we'd follow the bell, forgive us, do this. Here's what I think is going on. I think that God, well, I know God. God knows the heart of the people. They knew that they could, they could go to God and cry out and he would forgive them. But he knew their heart and he knew that they were really not sincere. Well, then the people turn around and say, well, be it done unto us according to what you want done. And then they did away with their idols and they started serving the Lord. In other words, they had not only proclamation of the mouth, but they had works and deeds to prove that what they were saying was right. And it's at that point in time that it says that the Lord could no longer bear their misery. And so um, he gathered them together and they're going, well, we've got to find somebody that will that will help us because of all this evil has been going on for 18 years, I think is how long it was this time. And this is when we see Jephthah arising. And Jephthah comes forth and is raised up. We do find out that he is a judge. Okay, It says this later on, that he is a judge. At first, Jephthah tries, tries to cut a deal. He tries to cut a deal with Ammon because Ammon says, hey, we want our land back that you took from us. And it's a threefold thing, see if I remember this. Uh, Jephthah said, well, to start with, we didn't take it from you. We took it from Sahan and Og. Okay? Second of all, we didn't take it, but God gave it to us. God gave us this land just as your God gave you your land. And the unspoken thing was, if your God really wants you to have this land, why didn't he give it to you? And then the third point was that Jephthah said, aside from all that kind of stuff, it's been 300 years. Why didn't you do something about it before? You know, this really is a scriptural thing against reparations. Okay, There's that's, that's all sorts of things that have been talked in our society of late about reparations. If you're not sure what that is, don't worry about it. If you want to know, look it up. Um, so anyway, uh, Amon would not receive this. So they came against Jephthah the fight. Well, here, and I got to say this quickly, Jephthah does something really, really foolish. Jephthah's about to go out in battle. He knows God's going to be with him. God has told him that. But right before he leaves, Jephthah does this and he says, Lord, if you will do this, I vow to you. If you will do this, then I will give a burnt offering, whatever walks out of my door when I come home. What is that all about? Here's what the problem is. He's trying to verify what's going on by cutting the deal with God. If you do this, I'll do this. If I do this, then you do this. You do not do that. And when you study the vows, if you're doing the homework with this, you saw it this week in Levit Le Leviticus 27. God is not into vows. He tells us as New Testament believers not to swear an oath. We're not to swear an oath. You're not to go into court and say, I swear. You can't affirm that your yes being yes and your no being no, but don't swear. And so he swore this thing and a horrible thing happened. They were victorious. They come back. The first person that greets him is his daughter. Well, Jephthah's just crushed. But he's crushed because of his stupidity. He tries to blame it on his daughter. So his daughter says, well, let me go to the mountains with my buddies for two months to mourn my virginity. Then I'll come back. There's two schools of thought about this. And I've only got a minute. Some people say what this means is that he then dedicated his daughter to the temple, to uh, uh, perpetual virginity. She was no longer going to be married. She was his only child. So he lost his children. And there's the great truth. I can argue both sides of these, from the Hebrew, from the situation. Nobody knows which one of these is true, though I suspect one. That's one thing. The other side says this is exactly what it was. Burnt offering means that somebody would have died and would have been offered up a sacrifice. I think that he had to offer up his daughter as a sacrifice. And people go, well, you know, the Jews were against a human sacrifice, yes. But the whole thing with judges is things get worse, things get worse, 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 worse. They had already adopted the practices of the people around them. So more than likely, he sacrificed his daughter because of a foolish vow he made. People say, well, Leviticus 27 shows us that you can get out of that. No, not when you look at the last verses right there. But I do believe if he had gone before God and said, Lord, forgive me for this, that the Lord would have. The lesson for us, don't make foolish vows. Trust the Lord. Don't try to cut deals with him. Again, I'm Dale from the Precept Classes in Cullman, Alabama. See you again next time. Goodbye.